I'm Sean Haney, and this is Real Ag on the Weekend. Let's get real and get connected with the week that was in Canadian agriculture. Real Ag on the Weekend starts now. Welcome to Real Ag on the Weekend. I'm your host, Sean Haney of realagriculture.com. Thanks a lot for joining us here on this great weekend, the first weekend in August, which is really hard to believe. <laughs> Time is flying by. We got, we, got, we got some combines rolling in some parts of Western Canada. She dry. She really dry. It's, uh, yeah, not not great. There's there's a lot of reasons to be, uh, there's a reason, we talked about the last week at the Saskatchewan Crop Report. There's a reason why it's sliding. It's called moisture. Heat, heat, which is normal for this time of the year. We can't complain about that. It, it's the fact that we have not received the, the rain that is creating a lot of the heartache and angst with a lot of you that are listening here to 980 CGME and 650 CKOM. Uh, Today on Real Ag on the Weekend, we're going to hear from David Coletto of Abacus Data. He's going to talk about, hey, look, look, like, don't blink, but Pierre Pauly of the Conservative Party of Canada are 10 points ahead of Prime Minister Trudeau and the Liberals. So what does this mean? Why is this gap been established? Because the Conservatives have had the lead before, but not 10 points. So what exactly has happened here? Also, we're going to hear from David Shednovic. He is with CN Rail to talk about CN's grain plan for the 2023 shipping season. There's been a, a, you know, this is the time of the year where we start to look ahead, obviously, as we harvest we haul stuff to the elevator, that's got to get on the rail, then that's got to get to the port, and then it gets on a ship. And a lot of things are got to line up logistically, and we tend to focus a lot on the railways. Now, sometimes lack of um, the system working, so to speak, railways are an easy target. But uh, sometimes uh, I think those fingers are pointed necessarily probably in the wrong direction or or maybe uh, misappropriately pr- weighted towards the railways. There, there's a lot of challenges at the port as well. Uh, we, we've seen that with some of the labor issues that they've had the Port of Vancouver. Always coming up is things like the fact the Port of Vancouver was rated so poorly, so poorly when it came to uh, performance. But uh, we're hoping for a good shipping season, and David is going to talk all about that and really shed some light on kind of how they're going to get things done. I, I I like going through these reports that CPKC and CN put out because it kind of gives you an idea what what are what the opportunities, where the barriers they provide some volume targets and and things like that. So uh, I think it's going to be pretty interesting to hear what he has to say. And we're also going to talk today about uh, a, a new uh, survey that Real Agri Studies has done, talking about consolidation in the ag sector and your level of concern or positivity towards it. And uh, also, we're going to talk specifically, we asked farmers specifically about the Viterra Bungie merger and whether or not you think it should go through. It's uh, some interesting data there as well for us to chew on. And I definitely want your feedback. Speaking of feedback, you can send me an email, shaney at realagriculture.com. You can also find us across all the different social media platforms, YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, uh, Instagram, TikTok, threads. <laughs> Make sure if you subscribe to our YouTube channel, you like and subscribe to the videos. I really appreciate that. And, of course, you can call the Real Ag Feedback Line, 855 776 6147 um, we also saw yesterday, Friday, we saw the jobs numbers come out. And I- interesting, so Canada's unemployment rate rose again last month uh, for July as the economy struggles to create enough jobs to match the pace of population growth. Statistics Canada reported Friday employment was little changed in July, falling by 6,400 jobs. The U.S. actually gained 187,000, which was also under the estimate. The unemployment rate in Canada ticked up to 5.5%. So we're starting to see a little bit of a loosening in in that job market. Unemployment, it's not moving up by full points. It's moving up by tenths, but it is starting to creep higher. The U.S., by the way, is at 3.5% unemployment. 
which is staggering to me. So now, one of the one of the theories, economic theories out there, is that the Bank of Canada will have to continue to raise rates. They will have to continue to raise those rates until we see unemployment rise, because that will that will be a showcase. That will be a signal that the economy is 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 definitely losing its steam, so to speak. The other thing we heard about economics this week is continue. Well, one was the fact there was a. Uh, credit rating in the U.S. that created by Fitch that created a lot of stir. Uh, the people pushed up uh, or pushed back against quite a bit in reference to the U.S. dollar. But we heard a lot about the numbers starting to show that maybe this deep recession, in the back half of 23, early part of 24, may actually not be what the reality is. We might actually see more of what one would call a soft landing. That sounds more appealing to me than a hard recession. The question is how the Bank of Canada steers through that kind of that kind of transition. I'm personally, <laughs> as somebody that has uh, money borrowed, and I know many of you do as well. I really hope we can pause from here. I, I really do. Like I, I, I know it's you know sometimes uh, you. you you think about you. We talk about the eighty. We do, we do not want to go back to the eighties, and we are a long way from the eighties, baby, in terms of interest rates, and music, and clothing, and a lot of things. We don't need to go back there. Um, hair bands. That's really. Do you think hair bands will ever come back? I I, I have my doubts. Right, rock music isn't even in the like vicinity of top forty anymore. It's 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 kind of bizarre, but anyway, we're from an interest rate perspective, we are a long ways away from the eighties. I, I I'm not sure how much more the Canadian consumer can 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 withstand when it when it comes to when it comes to to further rate hikes and servicing debt. So let's uh, we're just going to be standing by and watching what the Bank of Canada does. I think they meet next in September, so we got all August to kind of chat about this, but. Let's take a break. Um, when we come back, we're going to talk to David Coletto. The Conservative Party has a 10-point lead. It's the biggest they've had in a long time. What does it mean? How do we get there? And can they hold on to it? You're listening to Relag on the Weekend here on 980-CGME and 650-CKOA. Now, there's a reason we call it the corn school videos on everything from planter setup weed control field trial results yield strategies and so much more the corn school on realagriculture.com has the information and advice you need to help you succeed brought to you by pride seeds and bsf corn school episodes are available at cornschool.com from realagriculture.com or as a podcast from your favorite streaming service download the latest podcast today if you're involved in the agriculture industry, it's important to stay informed on all the latest issues affecting your business. At realagriculture.com, we offer fast, reliable news, information, and insights to help you keep on top of all of the latest in Canadian agriculture. Visit realagriculture.com and sign up for our free daily newsletter covering everything from news, agronomy, animal agriculture, and much more. Visit realagriculture.com forward slash subscribe today. I know there's been a lot of criticism of political polls for the past number of years. You know, polls having a hard time getting elections right. We've seen that in the U.S. We've seen it in Canada as well. But a recent poll by Abacus Data definitely grabs the attention of Canadians on on all sides of the political aisle. And it makes us wonder... What exactly is going on here? And what does it mean from the chances of there being an election call? And will we see the gap close? And the gap I'm talking about is Abacus Data has the Conservative Party of Canada and leader Pierre Polyev 10 points ahead of Trudeau and the Liberals. Well, the CEO of Abacus Data, David Coletto, joins us right now to discuss what they found and what this potentially means for the political landscape in Canada. David, great to chat with you. Great to see you again, Sean. 
Okay, uh, you do a lot of political polling, and I believe that you were the first one out showing a you know really kind of a I guess a change in the sense that the Conservative Party of Canada has pulled out to a ten point lead against the Liberals. Uh, this this was used as a big significant I guess push for the cabinet shuffle that happened last week. What is the data showing you? So yeah, it's the largest lead we've had for the Conservatives since the Liberals were elected in 2015. Um, you know, the, we and others have shown the Conservatives ahead, but only you know marginally two three points uh, upwards of five at some points. But but ten points is big, right? And it signals. Something's happening um, in in a number of parts of the country, right? No doubt the prairie solidly uh, conservative, uh, but what we're seeing is in British Columbia the Conservatives making big gains in Ontario. They now have a six point lead in our survey, and really interesting in Atlantic Canada, where where it had you know for the last three elections been just solidly red Liberal. Um, we've got the two parties tied there, so something's happening. Um, it's I think driven by. Uh, concerns about the cost of living, about you know disappointment and frustration with with the Liberal government, gen- general fatigue with a government that's been in office for eight years. But yeah, you know th- this survey was done before the cabinet shuffle, so we'll we'll see whether it it had any effect. I don't think it likely will um, because it really didn't change all that much um, from the overall government. But it was clearly a one signal, and I'm sure the government had their own data signaling, we've got to do something to demonstrate that that we're changing things up because people generally aren't that happy with what's going on. Yeah, you said that we're tired. And and so I've been wondering in terms of, is this something, you know, the, is, is Polyev saying something that's attracting new support or is it just sort of what Harper ran into where it's like, dude, you've been around here a long time and uh, we're, we're, we're kind of getting tired of the messaging and maybe a fresh face would be good. Is it w- what's happening here? I think it's a mix of, uh, I think it's mainly people just being, you know, frustrated or, or done with the liberals. Right. Um, and that, that is challenging for the liberals, but it's also still an opportunity for them. Like I don't count out, Justin Trudeau. I don't think it's a foregone conclusion that Pierre Polyev is going to be the next prime minister. And that's primarily because despite people's, you know, frustration, their desire for change, right? 80% of Canadians in our survey said they they want change in government. Only 20% thought the Liberals deserve to be reelected. A lot of those people, though, haven't given full thought to what the alternative would be um, and whether Pierre Polyev and the Conservatives, uh, despite how unhappy they might be with the Liberals, would they be any better? And and that won't happen till the campaign actually begins whenever it starts. So this is far. This is much more about the liberals. This is much more about uh, a sense that they don't, I think, have a, a clear vision. Like, what is it that they're trying to do and achieve? And, you know, if you're the a typical Canadian, um, it does feel like every week it's just more bad news. The price of things go up, interest rates rising, uh, people talking about a recession coming. And I think. The, the government is really hasn't been very good at communicating what it's doing to help people uh, on a day to day basis, even if it has a, a number of things it could talk about. I don't think they're doing a very good job at that. So does this 10 point lead, does this increase the chance there's a, an election soon or does it actually push it all the way back to fall, to fall of uh, you know 25? I I mean, if you're if you're the New Democrats who maybe have the easiest you know, are in the easiest position to determine whether there's an election. I don't see them wanting to to go because, you know, they're they're actually trending downwards as well. Um, and if you're the liberals, this would be you know complete folly uh, to think you could go into an environment like this and and have any shot at winning. So I again, you never know. Politics yeah. is incredibly unpredictable, and with a minority parliament, it, anything could happen. But I I hope because I don't want an election, and I don't think we're going to see one. Um, certainly this fall, maybe in the spring, but even then it all depends on whether, you know, interest rates, are they going to start to come down at all? And, and how are people reacting to, to what, what's going on in the world right now at that point? David, thanks a lot for joining me. Really appreciate it. You're welcome, Sean. Thanks. That was David Coletto, CEO of Abacus Data, talking about the 10 point lead the Conservative Party of Canada has on the federal liberals and Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, according to one of their latest political polls. After right after I had the conversation with David, news broke that the prime minister and his wife are separating. So that that's a factor too in all of this. Now I I actually don't believe that uh, that separation of their marriage in any way really impacts 
his his, his situ uh, the prime minister's situation and his popularity or lack thereof. I think in Canada the the you know what we would call from U.S. terms the first lady does not have the same sort of position or ceremonial view. Uh, like they do in the U.S. I think it would be a bigger deal in the U.S. than it is here in Canada. I, I think, you know, if, you, if you're a political uh, insider on the liberal side, you're trying to figure out how you leverage. And this is like the this is the ugly side of politics. But just to just a little bit of a note for everybody. Politics is ugly. <laughs> uh, how you leverage this separation to gain sympathy to actually maybe potentially improve support. How twisted and weird would it be if a, a separation for the prime minister in his marriage is better politically for him than the cabinet shuffle? That, that says a lot about the world right now. But – I, I do think, although I don't think it hurts his popularity or, or like I said, his, his support level, I, I do think that the separation does push the election out. That, that, that would be my guess that, you know, I, I'm, I'm not sure the conservatives are going to go there, so to speak, in terms of pushing and prodding on that and make I, I don't think that that is kind of some dangerous and that kind of maybe turns some people off that we're thinking about potentially voting conservative. And, and I think that's at the end of the day, there's other things that Canadians are actually concerned about. The, the housing crisis, as Coletto says, like I, I think that the housing situation is, is, is one that is of, of really great concern. Um, obviously, economic, the, the economy is another. There still is lots of concerns about things like inflation. Uh, obviously, interest rates have come up significantly. Like real, real food prices, real, real issues. Like, like remember what elections were about? Real issues. Yeah, that they, that did happen at, at at one time. I also wonder this. Even if even if you are the largest of Pierre Polyev and Conservative Party of Canada supporters, is is now when you want the election, or do you feel that? Maybe ten, this 10-point 10 lead is just the beginning, that you know, based on the longevity of, of this current government, it's, it's wearing thin. And then th maybe this lead that's 10 now is 15 or 20, and you just wait it out. I, I, in general, I just don't you – know, I think Abacus has shown that in their data that Canadians in general just don't want another election now. So – We'll see what the fall brings when the when the house returns. And uh, but my, my I think I said last week on this show, I, I at the earliest Q1 of 24. And, and David just kind of said the same thing. But uh, wow, well, I've maybe even bet this week. Maybe it's even a little bit a little bit later. It's uh, yeah, interesting times in Canadian politics. And, and hey, one has to wonder, like if you're the conservative party now, you you've got a 10 point lead. What got us here? Okay. And the other question you ask yourself is, how how do we make sure that we don't squander this? Like the Tampa Bay Rays in baseball this season. They got to off to an 18-0 start. They were amazing. Nobody could beat them. Team of the year. And since that, they've really kind of floundered. They squandered their lead. They're now in second place in the AL East. Right? So what, what do we need to do to not lose the lead. We want to build on it, but we don't want to do anything that risks pe turning people off and pointing them back in the direction that they formerly were. And, and of course, it's not about popular vote. It's about the seat allocation. The Conservative Party has always had trouble with efficiency of, of votes. So, uh, yeah, I, I, yeah we'll, we'll see how all this develops. And as Abacus does more and more of these polls, of course, we'll see what happens to this 10-point lead. Does it grow? Does it stay the same? Or is this the apex, the high point? And now we work our way and close the gap. Time will tell. Okay, let's take a break. We'll be back with more here on Real Ag on the Weekend. You are listening to 980 CGME and 650 CKOM. 
Canola is more than just a pretty face in the prairie landscape. It's a big business, both here and around the world, that requires you to be informed and up-to-date on everything it takes to grow a successful crop. The Canola School on realagriculture.com has an expert library of video resources covering markets, agronomy, and more to help you grow a healthy and profitable canola crop. Visit canolaschool.com today. Brought to you by BASF Canada and Invigor Hybrid Canola. The next generation is the future of agriculture, but how do we launch from one role to leading? From succession planning and family dynamics to understanding finances and making the tough calls to discovering paths others have taken all through agriculture, the Successors Podcast covers it all. Tune in with me, your host, Kara Oosterhaus, simply by searching The Successors on your favorite podcast platform, or you can find it by visiting www.realagriculture.com. Whether you're seeding, harvesting, or anything in between, The Wheat School on realagriculture.com has you covered. Timely agronomic information from industry experts available online anytime. Give your wheat crop a good start and a great finish with The Wheat School on realagriculture.com. Brought to you by CNM Seeds, Syngenta Canada and the Alberta Wheat and Barley Commission. We saw CN Rail and CPKC. You're still, we're still getting used to that, right? Not CP Rail, CPKC. <laughs> After that CP and Kansas City Southern merger. So uh, CN and CPKC released their, their grain plans for the 2023 crop year. Kelvin Hepner of Real Agriculture had a chance to catch up with the VP of Grain for CN Rail, David Shednovic, to discuss the grain plan from CN's perspective. Here's that conversation. So the new crop year is here. Uh, maybe take us through CN's plan for uh, getting this uh, this crop that I guess harvest is starting in some of the early areas, the plan for getting this crop to market. Yeah, just to uh, circle around quickly back, Kelvin, to the main two main considerations of the grain plan and what it's really meant to do. One, how much grain and processed grain products does CN expect customers to offer up for movement? How much will you move over the course of the crop year? based on what you know about crop size, carry-in stocks, et cetera, and two, detail the resources that you have in place to move that volume of grain over the course of the crop year. So everybody knows full well, a lot of uncertainty about crop size right now. Fair to say that we are looking at a, a below average crop unless something fundamentally changes, it's not going to. We guided uh, last week as part of our uh, quarterly investor call, based on feedback that we're getting from stakeholders, we signaled a crop around the mid-60s, and there's numbers all around that, that being the production in Western Canada, a million metric tons. We're going to update that as the crop year goes on. We file a monthly grain plan update. How did the month go? Cover off additional information. And just like we have in the past, we'll update the expected volumes that, uh, that we anticipate to move over the course of the crop year through that vehicle. The main thing is the resources in place to move the, the crop over the course of the crop year. Looking across the crop year over 12 months, we have upwards of 36 million tons of grain supply chain end-to-end to handle this year's crop. That is well in excess of the volumes that we expect that will be offered up for movement. Last year, CN made fundamental changes to its operating plan uh, under the direction of our new CEO, Tracy Robinson, when she came in in February. Those changes translated into material gains in velocity, the fastest we're moving the railroad since 2016. That created capacity. We made significant changes to our uh, aspects of our operating plan, including both internal and external communication. All of those things paid off insofar as CN consistently moved or uh, was able to move 90 to 100% of the orders placed for an individual grain shipment week either within the want week requested or within one to three days of the end of the want week. So that was that was a, a really great crop year in terms of strong, consistent movement. CN's got the resources in place to move the crop over the, uh, over the course of the crop year. Our locomotive fleet is expected to be on par with last year at 1,950 mid and high horsepower locomotives. And we are undergoing a locomotive uh, uh, modernization program to upgrade these locomotives uh, so that they're more efficient and have better pulling power. That's an ongoing initiative. Our hopper car fleet for grain movement in Western Canada is expected to be 
uh, the same uh, as last year. So we expect that will be ample to move the crop over the course of the crop year. And our hiring initiatives, uh, in the grain plan, there is a, a chart that shows you the change in uh, total operating crew base over time. And you'll see that that's been an upward trajectory. One of the major concerns that should be flagged is we are still assessing the overall impact of the federal government's changes to work rest rules uh, that impact uh, transportation workers. Think of it this way. It's kind of similar to changes with trucking rules, with log books, and, and limiting the number of hours that an individual can be running for an individual uh, run with truck. So if you really look at it, to move the same amount of traffic, you need hundreds more people to do the same amount of work based on those changes, those rules. That's a wild card that we are watching going into the crop year, but as it stands right now, uh, we expect that we will have the resources in place to move this crop over the course of the crop year and move it efficiently. So one of the key metrics that everybody always pays attention to is the, the weekly car movement and, and or, or volume movement. And those commitments, uh, I believe, looking back, CN has made the same commitment there as it did in previous years, 7,800 car, hopper cars per week outside of winter? Uh, yes, we have. We are capacity guidance is unchanged going into this crop year. And the primary reason for that is, Kelvin, this is an end-to-end -end supply chain. And when we signal guidance, we say, if all of these conditions are in place, if you have all the ingredients to bake the cake, including fluidity across grain terminals at the port, normal uh, operating conditions, let's say you don't have a mainline disruption that, that significantly impacts uh, movement of grain and other commodities, if you don't have a labor disruption, take a look at what's happened here over the course of the past year with disruptions, both with the Grain Commission and with the ILWU, for example. If you don't have those ingredients to bake the cake, you can't achieve those numbers. But if we look back at last year, CN, strong, consistent performance, where the supply chain fell down, it came down to the terminals and most, you know, in especially around uh, October, November, not being able to keep up with the, with the rest of the supply chain. And that culminated in late October, early November, with CN having upwards of 20 trains staged along the route to the port or back at origin because the terminals couldn't take them, because the ability to load grain and inclement weather, we're going to go into this crop year with the same playbook, which is that is still going to be a significant factor that's going to influence overall grain supply chain capacity heading into this crop year. So, yep, we haven't changed the guidance. 7,800 cars a week, Kelvin. You're pushing upwards of up to 750,000 tons of grain moving per week. That's what we moved in gut slot harvest last year. The size of that fall program for us has grown uh, proportionally greater than the growth in grain production in Western Canada on a percentage basis going back to the early 2000s. Uh, three quarters of upwards of three quarters of a million tons of grain moving per week is a pretty big number. And we're going to run with that and then see how the end and supply chain performs. All the components of the supply chain need to be working together to achieve those optimal levels. You briefly mentioned the, the labor issues at the West Coast ports there, the ILWU uh, strike that has been on again, off again through much of July and, and I think has yet to reach a real uh, resolution here in, in early August. It, grain isn't supposed to be, bulk grain shipments aren't supposed to be directly affected by this, but uh, how do you see that affecting the start of uh, the new crop year shipping season as, as things roll out and as harvest continues over the next couple months? Well, I think first, Kelvin, it's important to step back and let's understand that grain is not grain. You make the, a good point in so far as bulk grain movement through licensed grain terminals is not affected when it comes down to the Canada Labour Code. However, uh, grain moving through non-licensed facilities is impacted. Uh, container stuffers at the port, although not directly served or, or uh, touched directly by uh, the, the ILWU, I mean, they've got to get containers back and forth to the port into, into the terminals, and those terminals were shut. Uh, you also, of course, have a lot of grain moving out of Western Canada directly by a container. CN moved over 800,000 tons of grain direct from Western Canada by a container last year. Well, that traffic wasn't moving, was it? Uh, veg oil terminals like PCT, Pacific Coast Terminal, West Coast Reduction, well, they're not licensed grain facilities, so that would have impact, Im impacted the movement of canola oil. But in the whole scheme of things, if you really look back at it, the overall impact on grain was minor 
in relation to other commodities. However, recognizing that grain shares resources being locomotive and crew and uh, network infrastructure resources and appreciating that, you know, for every day that there's a, a, a work stoppage, it's five to seven days of catching up the supply chain based on what we signaled in our quarterly call. It was roughly up to eight weeks for the supply chain to fully recover. Could be up to eight weeks. So that's a factor to watch. That you know, the the major part of the disruption ended around July twentieth, and uh, that takes you eight weeks, takes you into the middle of September. That's when we'll really see the big ramp up in grain movements. So that timing, if you look at it in that perspective, shouldn't cause issues. But it, you know, grain's not the only commodity moving on the railroad. There's all kinds of other traffic. CN's got an obligation to move all of it. Again, we don't expect an impact, but this is the nature of the integrated supply chain. You cannot sit there and look at movement from a grain elevator to a grain terminal and not understand or appreciate that there's all these other factors that are going to influence how the supply chain performs. What's it going to take from CN's perspective, David, to be able to load grain in the rain in Vancouver? Well, Kelvin, we can load grain in the rain in the Port of Vancouver. And when I say we, I mean the supply chain. Uh, you know, what changed after the arbitration ruling back in 2018 was that using tarping to cover open cargo holds was halted immediately and procedures needed to change with respect to being able to load grain through feeder holes into hatch covers. What's a feeder hole? Basically think of it as a big hole cut purposefully in the top of a hatch cover so that you can keep the cargo hatch closed, so you can insert a grain loading pipe a spout and continue loading, albeit at a overall slower rate relative to if you were just straight pouring with the hatches open. It's a commercial decision about whether a grain terminal decides to set up to load grain in inclement weather on individual shifts. I've seen it reported, you know, where uh, people who have been involved in that supply chain uh, before would say, well, most of the time it's not worth the while of the facility to set up and take down, that's a generalization. Some facilities employ this more other than others in the, in the, uh, at the Canada's West Coast ports, um, specifically the Port of Vancouver. So it's not that it can't be done. It's more of it could be done if the wherewithal is there to do it is there. But going into the harvest, we're sitting here in the same spot as we were last year. So CN changed its operating plan. We're going to tweak that plan this year. We got the resources, but a year's gone by, and there's a lot of talk about, well, we're going to sit down and look at this with all the parties in the supply chain while we're still here sitting in the same boat we were last year. But make no mistake, it's a commercial decision about whether to set up and take down in inclement weather. That was David Shednovic, VP of Grain with CN Rail, talking about CN's grain plan for the 2023 shipping season. And uh, we'll see what harvest looks like. A lot of concern about what some of the production numbers are going to be and how much grain there will actually be to to haul. I maintain we are better than 21, not as good as 22. We'll we'll see where the final numbers lie, and uh, of course where exports land as 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 well. So if you want more information on that grain plan, you can go to realagriculture.com. Kelvin's filed a couple stories on it for you to uh, view and peruse and provide some comment as well. We'll be right back here on Real Ag on the weekend here on 980 CGME, 650 CQM. Hi, I'm Lindsay Smith of realagriculture.com. Join me Monday nights at 8 p.m. Eastern for The Agronomists, Canada's only live, interactive agronomy-based show. Each week, we answer your most pressing questions with a rotating panel of agronomists, researchers, and extension staff from across Canada. Join me Monday nights, 8 p.m. Eastern on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, or LinkedIn, or head to realagriculture.com slash live at 8 p.m. Eastern. Hi, I'm Bernard Tobin, host of the Soybean School on realagriculture.com. Throughout the year, on the Soybean School, we'll bring you timely agronomic video content from planting to harvest, from the latest agronomic research to the latest in production technology. Check out our massive video library on YouTube, realagriculture.com, or download the audio podcast versions wherever you get your podcasts. The Soybean School is brought to you by Pride Seeds, BASF, and Syngenta Canada. Recently, Real Agri Studies, which is the market research arm of Real Agriculture, we, we did a, a survey 
connected to our Canadian Farmer Sentiment Index in, in July, we asked farmers about consolidation. And, and this is really top of mind right now, I think because of the Viterra and, and Bungie merger that is, is looking to potentially happen. And, and, and just wanted to kind of gauge farmers, it, their, their perception right now of consolidation, how it potentially is negatively impacting them or, or positively impacting their farm operations. Farmers resoundingly, now this is across Canada, okay? 90% of farmers said they are concerned about consolidation in the Canadian ag industry. Which of the following do you feel is the best solution to consolidation in the ag sector? The, so these are the solutions to solve the problem. 38% was the highest rating. 38% said stronger teeth to the competition bureau. 36% said attraction of new competitors were applicable. So I, I think depending on what kind of segment of agriculture we're talking about, like if you're concerned about the consolidation of ag retail, th- that's a, a little bit easier <laughs> thing to solve because, because there's – lower barriers to entry somebody could be an agronomist and put up a phase three shed and they're in business to to increase competition in the grain sector that's a whole different ball game whole different ball game uh only four percent said more government intervention which which was interesting 50 or sorry 18 percent said that uh, we need to let the free market operate continuing we, we asked farmers where they had the most concern about consolidation. And actually, it was in equipment dealerships, okay? So farmers felt that consolidation in equipment dealerships was creating the most negative impact. And then there was a grouping uh, for second place of fertilizer manufacturers, grain companies, ag retails, and seed and chemical companies. Ag tech, precision ag companies, was the lowest impact farmers felt. In fact, 13% of farmers felt that Consolidation in the ag tech space was a positive on, on their business. Now, when we look at the concern or support for the Bungie uh, Viterra merger, 29% of farmers felt they were extremely concerned. 51% said somewhat concerned. So basically 80% either somewhat concerned or extremely concerned. When we asked whether or not this should be allowed to proceed, Interestingly enough, 70% of farmers, now this is from Western Canada, 70% of Western Canadian farmers said no, it should not be allowed to proceed. Will that be the reality? I, I have no idea. But that, that is some pretty interesting numbers there for, for sure. And then that's, hey, that's from the horse's mouth. That's how farmers feel uh, about consolidation and then more specifically about uh, the Bungie Viterra. 600 farmers answered the question. So this is not this is not like we asked ten people, six hundred farmers across Canada, about consolidation in in the ag space. One of the questions I have, because on the Viterra Bungie merger, there, there's conflicting points of view. So farmers, I think in general, as as our data shows, very concerned about consolidation. Ninety percent of farmers, okay, and seventy percent of farmers saying that specific merger should not go through. There's a perception, and, and actually, I should I should point out that the main reason of of why people felt it would negatively impact them, farmers said it really had to do with less options to to market their grain w- was one of the big real reasons. So uh, th- there also was a, a large concern about uh, poor basis. And lower prices. Th- those were the main reasons that people pointed to in, in, in this specific merger. And so here's what's interesting in, in the, differencing, the difference of opinion that is out there is, is that what I've been hearing from farmers, they're very concerned. When I talk to people that are in the grain industry, they're a little bit more ho-hum about some of the negative impacts. A lot of people talk about the lack of overlap. Now, I know there is overlap in some areas. But in general, what I continue to hear from the grain trade is that there is there's there's really not as much as we think. So very, very fascinating between the reality and perception. But honestly, perception a lot of times wins the day. There's no question about that. If you have any feedback on today's show, we'd love to hear from you. Send me an email, shaney at realagriculture.com, or you call the Real Ag Feedback line, 855-776-6100. 
24-7. Thanks, everybody, for joining us here for Real Ag on the Weekend on 980 CGME and 650 CKOM.